Well, a strong NATO alliance, that's what the Brits want. It sounds like a great idea. Who could possibly oppose that? But what would it really mean for the United States, this strong NATO alliance? Charles Krauthammer is a syndicated columnist and author of the book, Things That Matter. He joins us. He's thought a lot about questions like this. He's got a great column on it today. Charles, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. So it's Article 5 of the NATO alliance, about 70 years old, that really gets the heart of it, as far as I can tell. 28 member countries in NATO, and as it currently stands, an attack on one, I'm paraphrasing, but is an attack on all. Basically, it's a defense guarantee for all members. I would bet you money that Trump at one point is going to say, why would American troops guarantee the safety of, I don't know, Estonia, Lithuania, Albania, countries that, you know, aren't that important? Why would we send our troops to defend them? What would you say? Well, the Russians, the Soviets ask themselves that question every day during the 50 years of the Cold War. Would Americans really want to die in a nuclear war for East Berlin? Exactly. After all, the Germans hadn't been very kind to anybody during the Second World right. War. But this is the essence of deterrence, and this is the point of alliances. We don't do these alliances out of charity. I think that's what's wrong with Trump's America First vision. It assumes that foreign relations are a zero-sum game. They rip off our economy. They rip off our generosity. The fact is that when you have allies, and this is why people have had allies since the pharaohs, you multiply your power at lower cost. This is enlightened self-interest. The Marshall Plan wasn't charity. The Marshall Plan was a way to create a phalanx of countries who are sympathetic to us, democratic, to hold back, to weaken, to resist, to deter an existential enemy. Yes. And it worked without a shot it fired. Did. But you've got to have deterrence. You've got to have the other side believe that you will at least think about defending them with your own country. Yes. It's always been a problem. There was never a 100% guarantee that the Russians would believe that we would deter them if they took East Berlin. But they believed it. They didn't do it. And in the end, they gave up. But the Marshall Plan rebuilt big, significant economically meaningful countries rebuilt Western Europe to the benefit, I think, of everyone, and it was a bulwark against the Soviet aggression, of course. But we're now committed to a lot of little countries that aren't inherently significant. And so why are Estonia's interests the same as ours? Fifteen weeks before the announcement of the Marshall Plan by General Marshall at Harvard in May 47, the U.S. decided to defend Greece and Turkey, small countries, who cares about Greece and Turkey? 1947, the British had protected them, but they ran out of money, they ran out of will after the Second World War, they were done. Truman made the momentous decision, yes. which he announced in Congress, that we would defend countries that were being um, undermined by, essentially, by communism. We understood that small leads to large. Look, it was Chamberlain who said at Berlin, I'm sorry, he said, after Munich, when he made the deal with Hitler that essentially handed Czechoslovakia over to Hitler, he said, why should we care about a country, Czechoslovakia, far away of people we do not know? Right. But that's the point of alliances. You defend people far away that you do not know. And if you do that well enough and securely enough and in a way that is convincing enough, you have developed an alliance that creates sort of a community of free nations that will help you in a pinch, that will be there to defend you, and that will resist the greater evil. It's always the greater and the lesser evil. Right. And small countries, you know, are not to be dismissed. No, and I agree with that. And when Article 5, the one time, I think it was only invoked once after 9-11, and we did to get help us. That's exactly right. And we, we got something out of it. But you could also see how this could go very wrong as that famous web of alliances in 1914 produced the First World War. So Russia moves against one of these tiny countries, and all of a sudden, our sons are over there dying for the sake of Estonian freedom. And I don't think they would have much popular support here, do you think? I don't think the defense of Germany in the 40s and the 50s would have had a lot of popular support. But that's not how you gauge these things. What is the, was it the wise policy? Did it keep us free? Did it hem in? This was containment. This was not war with the Soviets. This was not reckless. The idea was if you contain them long enough, their system will collapse from the inside. And that's exactly what happened. Without a shot fired, our greatest geopolitical enemy, the ones that made you and me duck and cover growing yeah, up, for sure. they disappeared. Now, there's always a threat coming up. 
But the fact is that if you have allies, you've multiplied your strength. Yes, you create risks, but on balance, it's worked extremely well for us for 70 years, and you blow it up at your peril. It's like you say with Obamacare. You know, you can repeal, but then you got to replace. So what replaces it? Russian domination, Chinese domination, anarchy, do you, I mean, chaos. The last place we want that is Europe. The spread of chaos is probably the biggest threat. And when you have stability, you do what has maintained it for 70 years. I don't know if I buy that completely. That's the best argument I've ever heard, and you're kind of convincing me a little bit. Chaos is the worst thing. Well, if you can stop chaos, it's worth it. I'll come back and we'll finish this later. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. Charles Kramer. Thank you very much.